Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome uh, to the students who are attending our Professional Quest Business for a Better World panel this afternoon. My name is Carrie Willigan, Assistant Dean of Career Services, and we have a wonderful panel for you. Uh, so we're going to ask you to stay on mute. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we will uh, make sure that our faculty moderator, Professor Green Pemble, gets those questions. So I'm going to turn it over to our moderator. And um, we, like I said, we have a wonderful panel and we hope you enjoy it. Uh, Professor Green Pemble. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad that you can join us this afternoon on this gorgeous day. I hope you get outside to enjoy it at some point. We have three fantastic panelists um, here to start with us, and I'm just going to have them introduce themselves in alphabetical order by last name. So we will start with Janine Callahan. Hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. I'm Janine Callahan. I'm currently the Senior Vice President of uh, Masterpiece Services for a company called Masterpiece Solutions. We are, we are a, um, a small government contractor and we primarily provide software development services to the government. But I have a long career and a long involvement with George Mason um, going back to my master's program. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Great, Joe. Hi, thanks, I'm Joe Magro. I'm the director for uh, the Florida business for Titan Solar Power. Titan Solar Power is a privately held, uh, mostly residential solar installation company, uh, one of the largest in the country. It's um, a company that's been in business for about nine years and it's grown quite rapidly as um, we've uh, worked with uh, homeowners and businesses to expand solar energy across the country. Prior to the, my work here, I was vice president and general manager of a business unit at Thermo Fisher. Sorry, that's my alarm to not forget this call. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I snoozed it earlier. Um, and so um, I worked in the molecular biology business there, running a global business. And prior to that, I worked at GE Healthcare. So I've always been interested in uh, using my engineering degree and my business background and doing something in business that does something better for the world. Nice, Madison. Hi, I am Madison West. I am the Vice President of Environmental Social Governance, or ESG, at Maximus as part of our investor relations team. Um, Maximus is a publicly traded government contractor. Um, we help millions of people around the world access the health and human services benefits from their governments um, and really work to um, ensure there's no barriers to access to these vital services. Fantastic. Um, so as um, Carrie Willigan mentioned uh, earlier, I serve as co-director along with my colleague Ann Magra, who is on this call, um, of our Business for a Better World Center. And so this panel is especially important to us because it's what we do, right? We believe that a better world is everybody's business. And so the first question I just want to play around with, and, and you can sort of have at it in whatever order you would like, um, which is, how do you define business for a better world? And, and how do you see that as different or maybe similar to corporate social responsibility? Or we can just go in order again. Janine, do you want to try first? <laughs> okay, well, um... So I'm sure that that um, Madison, who kind of has this in her job title, will have a more nuanced definition of it than than I do. Um, so I would say that um, I often feel like um, corporate responsibility can sometimes be what a company does, you know, after they do their business to then, you know, show that they're a good citizen of their um of their community, right? And I think oftentimes of corporate outreach and, um, you know, um, sort of charity sort of things, um, other involvement with, um, with things that are going on in the community that are adjacent to their business or that are of interest to their employees. Um, I, so I tend to think of business for a better world as being more holistic and it's um, kind of what you do as well as how you do it. And, and having the, um, the community and the various um, stakeholders being at the center of the kind of organizational design and the, and the organizational intent. So that's, you know, kind of my rough, um, you know, difference between the two. Although I, I do think the terms can be 
or are likely used um, pretty um, simultaneously, you know, um, interchangeably. Thank you, Joe. Wow. Okay. So I think this is a tough question. Uh, <laughs> so I'll look forward to hearing what the others have to say. Um, I, um, uh, I think that as a small, like a private company that's been growing up, this company that, that was started here eight years ago started with two employees. And now we have about 1500 across the country. I think it's 1800 now. It changes rapidly. I don't know that we've thought about these questions um, that much. I know that um, when I worked at Thermo Fisher um, in the molecular biology genetics space, you know, the work we were doing was part and parcel to making a better world. Um, and even at GE Healthcare. And those things really resonated in uh, what employees thought about when we went to work every day. Uh, because even if you were in a supply chain management or you were in the factory floor, all those things and what it related to quality um, led to an outcome with a patient or a scientist doing research. Uh, the COVID vaccine, right? The work that went into that, um, the work that's going into um, solving these big problems like um, people that have genetic defects um, or even diseases that are related to genetics that we can actually help uh, predict or solve now. So um, I think that uh, you do have that part of people that have corporate responsibility where uh, some companies, it seems like maybe they're trying to check the box with, um, you know, well, we're trying to make money. And at the same time, we do some of these nice things for the environment or the community, we donate money. Um, and so I think there probably is a difference in, in terms of what a, a, a company's uh, vision and mission is. I think at Titan Solar Power, we're probably sort of straddling the line. Um, it's a company that was probably started for business, but as we've gotten bigger, we've had to think about these things. And um, uh, there's some really cool initiatives that we can do that are both with what we do every day does help the world and the environment, which is really exciting. Um, but there's actually some cool things we're doing that are actually outside of that, but where we can lend our expertise, like our Give Power initiative, which is uh, building um, solar uh, water plants around the world in communities where they don't have clean drinking water. So um, that is a pretty cool thing to be a part of while we're doing our day-to-day -day of putting solar panels on rooftops, which is very much a construction business. So. Great. Okay, Madison, we're all waiting for you because you have it in your job title. <laughs> <laughs> well, they all, both of you said great components of it. Um, I'll do kind of a, a brief synopsis of the history of what is corporate social responsibility of a sense in kind of four key phases. So the first several decades ago was if you're in a CSR type class, you'll probably read some paper on this is the triple bottom line. So how are companies accounting for the impacts on people and planet? Those like were the kind of P's there. People, planet, and profit, three P's back then. Um, this then evolved to CSR, corporate social responsibility, um, as companies wanted to provide reassurance of what they were doing right. Um, and this had a really strong philanthropic lean. So I, I agree with what both of you said. There is a little bit of a check the box uh, mentality and situation that can, can arise from the ambiguous nature of CSR. Um, I'd say then it kind of moved to this catch-all of sustainability to try and give it some sort of framework and purpose. Um, but I think that the use of sustainability loses the social side um, and really becomes the environment side. Um, so it's not quite, it, it becomes a little bit muddied as to what you're talking about. And so today's terminology that you know, we use the most is ESG, environmental social governance. Um, I think what that does is it creates a set of standards and corresponding analysis of related risk factors for a company. So um, while there is still a check the box aspect to it, it becomes harder to do that um, because it looks at an analysis of the impact of these factors on returns as well as a company's impact on social and ethical value. Um, it's certainly a complex concept and very widely diverse and broad, and we'll, we'll certainly talk about that today. Um, but it, I think it also means that it has um, some power behind it that perhaps CSR was lacking. Um, and as a publicly traded company, as a counter to Joe, I'll say for us actually, uh, you know, it's, it's core to who we are and our mission. 
but the investment community is really driving this transition to the accountability factors. Um, and I think that's a, a component of why, you know, the funds behind this can um, really mean that business is a key stakeholder in how we build a better world um, as well as, you know, that as, as one can take that. Wow, those are three really great answers. Um, part of the reason I bring up that question is we have, well now 128 participants um, on this uh, call now. And so for those of you who are really interested in exploring corporate social responsibility, ESG, um, stakeholder capitalism, any of those kinds of topics where you're interested in the role that business can play in contributing to greater social and environmental good, um, just want to do a newsflash and let you know that we are in the process of creating a minor uh, in business for a better world, and it will have courses across the university. So if that's of interest to you, keep your eyes out. Um, we're just putting it through now, so these things take time, but um, I, I think it would be of interest to you if you are if you care about these topics. So Joe, we're going to start with you. We're going to just rotate who we start with, and then we'll go to Madison and Janine. Um, can you talk a little bit about the career path that you took to get you to where you are today? Like, did you always know that you wanted to do this, or how did you get here? Okay, thanks. Well, I went um, to the University of Michigan um, Engineering School, and that was uh, an entrance not knowing what I really wanted to do, but I was pretty good in math and science in high school. And um, so I decided to go after engineering because I thought from there I can switch majors if I need to, since it's hard to get into. So I didn't know if I want to get into business maybe or engineering, I did that. And through my internships uh, in school, <clears throat> I realized that I didn't want to be working in a brake plant at General Motors. Nothing against General Motors or people that make brakes, but um, it was a heavy industrial kind of thing. And um, I decided I want to get out and be with people and be out in the world. And so I got into sales and marketing with General Electric. And um, uh, I realized once being there, that whole part I talked about earlier about feeling like I was part of something bigger was very important to me. And so then I started to make a career out of that because I, I was not a frontline healthcare worker, but I could, when I would um, be responsible for a hospital purchasing a, a MRI machine, for example, um, I felt a connection to that because I saw it in use and I saw patients going in and out of there. And I knew that outcomes were being impacted. So I was indirectly involved and helping make sure that equipment stayed up operating full time. So um, I did that. I got a, a, my uh, MBA from Indiana University as I wanted to get a broader um, set of skills and put to practice some of the things I learned at GE. And then that helped lead me to my career at, uh, at Thermo Fisher in the molecular biology space. So um, uh, when I had a chance to exit that business because of a consolidation and a, um, a, uh, some business structure changes, I got into this family business, uh, trying to do something even more entrepreneurial than I'd done before. And the whole momentum going in the industry with solar, especially in Florida at the time, there was a constitutional amendment that really opened up homeowners to own solar. And I'd always wondered, living in Florida for 10 years, why there were no solar panels on homes. You see them in California, you see them in the Northeast even, places where it's snowing half the year. But we didn't see, all you would see is systems on the rooftop that were uh, heating up swimming pools, uh, which is nice. Uh, and that gives you a little extra use of your swimming pool in the season, um, but it didn't really have much of an impact. Uh, and so I thought there was a chance here to really make an impact in Florida. And, um, and the industry has absolutely grown leaps and bounds in the state. Um, in uh, in the last four years since we got into this. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Madison, what would you say? Uh, well, Joe and I are different left and right brain oriented people. <laughs> um, so math and science was not my uh, strength. I was more of the uh, creative writing, um, uh, English and uh, international relations factors. Um, so I went to college at Johns Hopkins um, and I actually did know I wanted to go into CSR from the start, um, but it wasn't, uh, there weren't quite the number of jobs with that actual job description back then. Um, and so I started actually in the nonprofit space, more of the hands-on social impact aspects, um, learned very quickly that the financial acumen is important no matter what role you're in and whether you like math or not. 
Um, and so um, when I had the opportunity to come to Maximus, which uh, I really wanted a company that had the mission and values that align with the CSR scope. Um, and so when I came here, I was able to then help actually build our ESG program um, and evolve over the last now more than seven years um, in, in a way that really aligns with the ethos of both our company and ESG as a whole. Great, thank you, Janine. Oh, that's, that's, those are just such great stories. Um, so I, uh, I actually also um, started out with um, aspiring to a career actually in the Foreign Service. So I graduated from Georgetown's um, Foreign Service School. Um, when I graduated, which was quite a while ago, um, we were in a bit of, a, of, a, of an issue with the job market. And so um, I wasn't actually able to get a government job at that time. And so, you know, like, like many folks, I leveraged my network. And I had a friend of a friend who um, had a job opening um, doing um, sort of financial analysis, economic analysis for a small company that um, supported the Navy. And that is really, really where my government service career started. Um, I did spend some time as a civil servant, uh, about eight years, and then uh, left um, as a direct government employee. I've been um, a government contractor ever since. Um, I have loved and spent, I've spent most of my career and, and um, have really loved working for small companies um, and uh, really enjoy that because I like knowing that I can make an impact. And that's something that's been really important to me from the very beginning in my career. And um, it's kind of one of the driving forces for leaving the government was I wanted to go somewhere where, you know, just I could I could have um, be part of something right building something and building a business I, I really enjoy that I'm um, on my third with my third small company um, that's growing and I've really developed um, a bit of a, of an approach and expertise on scaling and maturing um, smaller businesses to be able to, to kind of build a foundation for more growth. Um, I um, I really was able to you know take advantage of a new program in Mason back back in the day, um, this technology management master's, which was framed at that time as an MBA for, uh, for technical services companies, so or technical service professionals. And since I've worked around technology my entire career, even though I'm not personally a technologist, um, I, uh, I found that the coursework was very, very valuable for me. And one of the things that I took from that that has been um, also an, uh, an area of additional study, and then something I use all the time is um, organization development and kind of interpersonal understanding how people and groups interact and, um, and really kind of how to look at, at change and how to look at change um, on the impact of people and organizations. Um, and I, I weave that into my work every single day. And so today um, I run a, a, an organization of about 80 software developers. Um, all of our folks provide um, technical support to the government um, in various um, different ways. I really love being part of the government support industry. I feel like it's part of my contribution to public service to run a well-run business that spends, you know, everyone's, you know, taxpayer dollars efficiently and effectively. Um, and I'm really take a lot of pride in the companies that I've helped um, grow in this area. So. That's fantastic. And you, <clears throat> many of the students on this call are, are or have recently taken our uh, some foundations courses. And Janine, you just hit on topics like the importance of networking, the importance of interpersonal relationships and teams um, and things like that. And so that that's really great. And Madison, you were talking about just you coming from a completely different perspective and both you and Joe have, well, you know, I was an engineer and then I decided to get an MBA and you were like, well, I'm interested in creative writing. And then I decided to go and, you know, apply that to corporate social responsibility. And so I'm sure I hope students are seeing some of the connections uh, to some of the work that they're doing in the classroom. I want to now turn and we'll go with you starting first, Madison, 
Uh, the last two years have been especially difficult because of COVID-19 for all sorts of reasons. Um, I can't help but note that two years ago we were doing these professional quests in person and uh, <laughs> we are now doing them online still. So I'm wondering if you can talk about um, how COVID uh, has impacted your business, your career, the initiatives um, that you are undertaking, any, any of that would be fair game. Yeah, I mean, definitely a broad topic. I probably won't, you know, touch upon all of the aspects of that question. But um, one positive that has come out of the pandemic is that it has accelerated um, stakeholder capitalism and focus on ESG um, by underscoring that interdependence of long-term financial value and the social environmental factors of business and uh, uh, companies. Um, and so we've really seen this through our shareholder engagement. It was certainly increasing prior to the pandemic, but in the last 18 months, um, we are just getting so many more questions. We have so many more requests for meetings and, and data inputs and uh, the questions have gotten a lot better from our shareholders. It used to kind of be a check the box question and now they ask really detailed um, and insightful questions. So the conversations are, are really fun to have. Um, I would also say that through these 18 months, the growing global focus on racial and economic justice and equity um, has really sharpened the spotlight on a company's societal role and responsibility um, for how and for whom they create value. Um, and so I think as a result of those components, ESG has really emerged as a critical lens um, through which investors, potential employees, current employees, customers, um, your community at large, um, schools and universities are assessing um, businesses' resilience, um, and then on a more company-specific basis, the competitive differentiation of your business. Um, we definitely faced a lot of challenges with COVID-19. We have more than 34,000 employees that we needed to move from on-site to remote work from home while still operating essential services for government. Um, so we actually were, many of our projects were considered essential by the federal government here in the U.S. Um, and so that's, you know, I think Janine talks a lot, has the, the technology um, perspective and insights. So, uh, and I'm certainly more so than I do, but a lot of our earlier investments made that possible. Um, but it also definitely challenged us in the same time. Um, and it's changing what our, our workforce will look like for the future um, and how we really create um, that flexibility overall. Okay, so you touched on something here. And so before I turn it back to Janine, um, this last comment about how it's changed uh, the workforce and what you're kind of seeking, do you want to just touch on that a little bit? Because I think that's really relevant to um, our students. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know that we have the answers. I think we're we're also figuring that out, and it's coming down to we do a lot of um, employee t like pulse checks and surveys and conversations and um, all of those things um, to make sure we're uh, aligned with what they're looking for. And it is a mix. We have people who want to be in an office. I am in an office. Um, and then we have people who are who don't want to return to the office. And so how do we make sure that we're building a culture that aligns with that shift, um, a technology resource? So um, making sure that conference rooms post pandemic are set up for in person and virtual engagement. Um, how do we manage all of that? Um, and so I think it's a, an evolving and learning process um, for sure, but one that requires communication. Fantastic. Um, just a reminder before we turn it over to Janine to talk about how COVID has affected um, her work environment. Uh, if you ha do have questions, please go ahead and email them in the chat so that we can bring those questions forward. Go ahead, Janine. Um, so I think that, you know, as a small company, um, 
you know, we experienced a lot of the same challenges that, you know, our, our larger, you know, uh, large organizations do. I would say specifically for Masterpiece, because of the customers that we support, uh, most of our, well, all of our um, engineers were on site. And so, and, and really were not able to actually do their day jobs from home. It's just not possible in that environment. And so, you know, for us, we had a lot of folks that, um, if you are familiar with it, the CARES Act, which allowed our, our folks to do, you know, training and other things that would help them, you know, maybe be more effective when, when we could come, you know, when we started to come back, but they, and they were allowed to, we were allowed to invoice that time. That was a, a real lifesaver for companies like ours, right, that were smaller and had to somehow figure out how to keep our folks together um, when they couldn't actually work, period, and they couldn't work from home. Um, so, so we were able to take advantage of some of those um, aspects that, that kept the business going. The issue um, of culture, though, is, is huge because you know, we were very much an in-person organization um, because our employees didn't work out of our corporate office. The corporate office was the social hub, right? It was it was where everybody gathered, um, and it's close by our customers' um, locations. And so, um, when we pivoted to to virtual, we've had it's been hard. It's been hard to keep folks connected and to um, foster that sense of, of community spirit and, um, and engagement, right, across, across the board. And so I think that's, that's going to be an enduring challenge. And we have the other level, which I'm sure, Madison, you, have, you all have some of that at Maximus too, which is we really have to be guided by what our customer will allow. And I do think that that is, you know, one of the th one of the trends that's moving forward is, you know, our customers are looking at ways to figure out how to do more work, create more telework opportunities, because, you know, they're losing, they're losing their own employees. We're having a hard time with retention um, when we can't offer telework because other organizations can. And, um, and, and especially for a company that, you know, provides software, I mean, everybody needs software developers, right? <laughs> like it's, it's um, the core, you know, basis of so much work. So those are, those are big challenges for us. And we're really trying to work with our, you know, our customers in, in partnership to help them understand, you know, how to, how they can best sort of segregate work so there's we can offer our employees um, what they want, which is, you know, most times a blend, right? Folks that are used to working in our environment know the really cool work tends to get done, you know, in a customer space, but the ability to pull apart and have some things where they can have a certain amount of telework, I think, will be key to success in the future. Nice, Joe. Thanks. Um, so we had some very practical um, issues that came up in that we're a, a team that is the backbone of our business is on our construction, our installation crews. And so these are groups of people that ride around in groups of four in a truck and a trailer. And so the, the core part of the business, which is installing uh, systems uh, becomes very difficult if you have to people have people socially, you know, distancing. Um, and one person who is sick can bring it to a lot of people very quickly as well. Um, and getting the people who are used to holding the tools in their hands and um, are some of them are kind of tough guys to get them to embrace some of the things that had to be done, like getting vaccinated um, and uh, being responsible among other people. Uh, we, we had to do a lot of work on education because the, our employees were not people necessarily who watch the news or pay that much attention. They mostly do their job and they go home to their families, or they might have a second job, some of these folks. So um, we had to do a lot of education um, and getting buy-in. And we were talking about the organizational development stuff earlier. We really had to lean on some of those skills of the people in our company that, that had some skills there 
um, to, uh, to do that because we had not really encountered something like that before. At the same time, a boon for business was that people were doing home improvement projects. So everyone's heard about that and people were staying <laughs> home and they're, they're not moving and they're adding to their house. And so people were open to the idea of solar power on their home. So we had an increase in demand and yet we had a labor supply problem. Both people that had to be sent home, people who opted out of work uh, because they, um, there were some programs that allow them to sort of opt out a bit. Um, so it was very challenging. We had some employees who died of COVID uh, or COVID complications. And that emotionally um, uh, was very difficult, um, even as much as uh, one of our um, associates passed away very suddenly. And um, the crews, all the installation crews took their trucks and trailers, just like the police or the fire department would, mm. and drove by the hospital. So um, it was kind of a scary thing. It was really scary for some people and it affected morale and such. So we had to try to keep business going while also balance the employees and their families' needs. So I think we did a pretty good job at that overall um, and tried to balance the customers' needs. So customers are somewhat understanding of lead times going on permit departments and building departments. We're going through a very dramatic thing. Like I imagine other government offices where, where they're used to working in an office and someone with paper and they're passing paper files. They were not digital. And then they're all sent home. How do you get something as simple as a building permit done? So the, the government offices learned a whole lot, even the local city governments and uh, implementing new systems and technology to allow themselves to do these things. They might have two people in the office who are the reviewers. So they didn't need a digital system. Here, I'm done with it. Here you go. And they pass it over <laughs> across the desk. Uh, and they had to figure out how to do this now working from home. And they started by driving and dropping stuff off in their mailboxes to each other. And then they started implementing systems using email. And we've seen a big growth of technology in the government, the local government offices because of this, which I thought was really an interesting side note, because now that they've done it, they realize the efficiencies of it. And they want us to work with them in a digital way. Um, so those are a few of the things that, that uh, come to mind for our business. And we also, one thing I wanna mention is as a small company growing up, we had a problem where our headquarters was in Arizona and then we had a few regional offices and there's a huge disconnect between these regions and uh, like Florida and other places where they often had kind of done things their own way, um, tried to get help from, from a corporate office that wasn't really acting much like a corporate office as much as they were acting like an Arizona office. So our company also went through this phase and I was trying to help the company along because I'd been a part of it at these bigger companies before. And I was trying to help our, our corporate leadership team along. Fortunately, we had just implemented a new ERP system right before uh, the pandemic. And um, it was an Oracle product called NetSuite. And it took us to a place where we were just implemented, thank goodness. And we could work remotely in an efficient way. Uh, and now that we're coming out of this, our company has had a great impact and now knows how to work with the 40 different regional offices we have uh, and work in an efficient way. People knowing how to do online meetings. Some people hadn't done Zoom before. So um, for me being from the big company, it was very frustrating at times to try to get my colleagues pulled along, um, but uh, we're in a better place as a company, although it's been quite a challenge for a lot of individuals and, and families and friends, people who've, who've lost people important to them. Mm -hmm. Wow, those are some powerful, powerful stories. Um, thank you all for sharing that. We've got some student questions, um, and I'm going to combine a couple of them because um, one of the students, and I think some of you have touched on this, but I invite you to, to expand on it in terms of how the change um, in teleworking, um, people's preference to work at home may have impacted your business. And then have you noticed any change in efficiency between the people who are working from home and the people who are working on site? I'll just throw that out to, to those to anybody who wants to answer it. Yeah, so from an efficiency factor, we really didn't, we had, we were quite efficient. Um, and uh, I think there's also a component of one piece of advice for everyone is set your own boundaries to ensure you don't have burnout because while we were exceptionally per, uh, efficient, there's also no separation uh, during that time. Um, that being said, 
a lot of the work we were doing was around the clock support for vital services. So, you know, it, it felt impactful for every moment that you were doing that. But now that we're kind of in a more normal, normalized cadence, that's, that's one piece there. Um, in, in terms of b between work and virtual, I think this is just the, the nature of where we were evolving prior to the pandemic and it was accelerated. Um, and so both have their own benefits and both have their own challenges and working between those is, is a, on the company and on you. So, you know, making sure that if you are a virtual worker, a remote worker, that you still engage and connect with your colleagues. So you may not see each other in the kitchen or the break room, but setting up 15 minute coffees with somebody at 8.30 before the day starts becomes more important to continue to build your relationship. And as Janine started today, you are network um, at the company. Um, I'm sure you all have taken classes and uh, gone over the difference between sponsors and mentors. That wasn't really a terminology when I was in school. Um, but that's that's how you build that is through those one on ones. Um, and so it, it is, becomes a priority to figure out how to do that in a virtual world. I'm going to oh, learn what the mute in. button is. Sorry, I was going to say, do you want to comment on either? <laughs> sure. You want me to go ahead? Um, we um, we do a lot of project management um, at our company. And it's sort of like an assembly line as a project comes through, it goes to different departments and has to keep moving. And um, it's definitely a different environment, people working when they're used to having that person next to them and they can just walk over and say, hey, can you help me out with this project? Uh, it's very difficult sometimes. People are very busy, right? So busy is kind of a general term, but people have a lot of work to do and they have a lot of projects to touch in a day. And so, you can interrupt them easily when you walk over, but it's hard to interrupt a person when you don't know what they're doing or where they are right now. And that's a very practical problem um, that it, sometimes people don't think about. And if you don't have a good way to, to handle it, you can set yourself back or you can get frustrated. Um, and also uh, that person, if they're uh, you know somewhat invisible, they might be doing their work. You know, Matt, Madison was talking about it. You've got to make sure you're visible uh, because you can do your work 99% of the time effectively, and it goes maybe even unseen by a lot of people, but the one or two times they need you and they can't reach you, people remember that. So from a very practical standpoint, it's just like anything. And my son, um, who's 13, was doing school at home and he would be in class and he would be on mute, but he wasn't paying attention for that moment when the teacher called his name. So he heard 99% of it, but he missed that one key moment. And so that affected the perception and the teachers willing to engage with him uh, permanently in that class because it happened a couple of times and it, it affected him and it affected, um, but it was a good learning lesson. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that was a, a good thing is, you know, it was difficult. Uh, people can work in the environment well, but it's important to them for their career, I think, and their engagement and their learning in a company as Madison was alluding to, to stay engaged. Uh, and they have, you have to make an extra effort to be engaged. You have to participate more than you normally would have to because you're just, just showing up isn't, you can't do it the same way. And you also have to be diligent if you're working from home um, that you don't get into the pajama um, kind of slow start. Um, it's easy to do. I worked from home for 10 years and uh, meaning I'd go see clients and such, but I, when I wasn't with clients, I was home and I could wear pajamas. I sat in the basement in my Wisconsin house in the freezing cold with the, with that snuggy thing they used to sell. So, <laughs> right. And we weren't having zoom meetings, so I didn't have to be accountable to that. I was just on the phone, but you can get into kind of, if you're not the right person, you can get into a lazy attitude with that. Um, and so you have to watch it. You have to know what kind of person you are, I think. Um, and what motivations you need externally to get you going. Some people need to show up to class to be motivated to listen. It's just the reality. Or to do that tough assignment, they need to be with a group. Some people are great at going to the library for eight hours and just killing it on their own. That's not how I was. So um, it's, uh, I think, up to each individual. And the company you know, needs to provide resources and tools for these groups that are in office and out of office to still work effectively. 
Great, great, great. Janine, did you want to add anything? I just a little bit. So, um, so at this point, you know, in my career, I, I I tend to be leading teams, and so I was uh, I was at another company actually when um, when we first locked down, and so um, and I led the corporate team. So we had to pivot ourselves and then pivot our ability to support our. Um, you know, the, the billable staff, right? And um, so that was one, you know, big challenge was to, you know, keep us connected. And then, uh, and then we had a situation, which I'm sure others of you have experienced where, you know, after about six months, I had people who are like, well, why am I living in the DC area? Like, why am I hanging out in Northern Virginia? And I had people move to other areas because they are, they're like, well, this seems like pretty effective. How about if I move to Charlotte? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but then um, last year or earlier this year, still all, you know, pretty locked down, uh, I changed jobs. And so I had to, um, you know, meet a new team and meet, um, you know, new employee or employees that were new to me. And that was an enormous challenge. Um, if you, if you take, if you take that seriously, if you if you take being connected to people seriously, which I do, um, and it's why you know why again why I like small companies. Um, wow, that you know, and and helping them understand who I was and uh, why I was there. It's a new position as well, so um, boy, that was you know that was hard, and um, and I would say that I think that's part of what's going to be an ongoing challenge, right? As we move and um, take on new positions, you know, on the one hand, when you, when, you know, as a, as an individual contributor, you know, taking that responsibility and maybe, you know, over-engaging, right? Um, but then also as leaders, we have to, you know, remember to kind of bring our teams together, but also, you know, really find ways to connect so that people can get to know us um, in ways that we used to do in person. All right. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I feel like that was something that, you know, was really challenging. And I, you know, to be, to be honest, I, I, I don't know if I'm as connected, um, you know, I'm not, I haven't been there a year yet, so I still have time, but it's, it's an ongoing, you know, it's an ongoing challenge. There are people I have never seen their face. That are in my organization because they don't they don't like the camera. I've talked to them on the phone, you know, but I have not met them in person, um, and um, and they don't they won't won't don't do video. So um, yeah, and I I uh, I have a mission to kind of find those people and meet them in person because it's it's a you know it's important. So. Well, that's great. So we have um, keep the the questions coming, guys, because the um, I really enjoy um, seeing them. So please uh, continue to to share the questions. I think this one sounds like it might be directed to Madison, but I feel free, Joe or Janine, to answer it. But would the ultimate goal of investing in ESG funds be to change other companies' behaviors, to increase the returns on the companies who are making the right decisions? A combination of the two, something else. What do you think? Great question. Um, cert certainly, um, investment funds have the ability to enact some change in companies. So if you look at BlackRock with Larry Fink's letter that has elicited, elicited tons of change through one letter. Uh, mm -hmm. He's down, now done it a few years, but every year companies change according to what he said. Um, that's not to say that smaller funds can't also impact change. I engage with um, smaller funds all the time uh, to learn about what their priorities are because it's still pretty broad and disparate as to what everyone's looking at within ESG. Um, and so I think the key is to be able to know what your company's materiality is um, and then frame it that way. Um, and then in terms of the, the returns, so uh, I mean, every public company and every investment group is going to look at ROI and the I mean, that's just returns. It, it comes down to financials, as I noted before, regardless um, of what kind of fund you are. Um, 
I will say that there are statistics out there showing that ESG, strong ESG companies are outperforming non-ESG oriented companies. Um, and so I think that continuing to invest in those show is a, is a solid uh, investment plan, but ultimately it's still an investment portfolio and uh, that still is an evolving space. So I won't pretend that the ESG funds are there solely for the social impact side of it. They have investment reasons um, that are proving why they're doing this. Great. Joe, Janine, anything you want to add? No? no. Um, another student question, Janine, I think you touched on this a little bit, so maybe you want to kick it off. Uh, one of the students um, asked, did you find that once COVID hit, people began to improve with their communication? My experience is that, well, I was gonna say it's 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 not absolute, but I, I I saw trends and they actually went in two different directions, right? Um, there were people who um, who really did make a concerted effort to improve how communicative they were, you know, across any number of channels or to try new channels. So, you know, in our company, we have Slack. We still do a fair amount of email. Um, I text with my team members and my boss all the time. Um, we're big about we're big on phone calls. So I mean, they're probably I mean, telex. Like we, there's probably you know, no channel that we're not um, trying to engage on. And personally, I don't want technology or or the communication channel to ever be a barrier. So I try to be up on all of them so that anyone can reach me in the way that's most comfortable to them. Um, I do think, though, that there is also a constituency that just disengaged, right? And 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 um, whether they were already that was kind of you know what they were most comfortable with anyway, and so without a lot of the you know maybe force forcing functions to in, to interact, um, they just kind of moved to their the area where they were the most comfortable. Um, you know, I do think that there were definitely people, there still are people that are harder to get a hold of than they used to be. Um, and we worry about those folks all the time, right? Because we want to make sure they do feel connected and that, you know, I don't want the, I don't want the next interaction, you know, with them to be a resignation email, right? <laughs> or worse, a resignation text. Um, so I think, you know, you, you really have to know your people and really know who are the ones that are trending in the, you know, kind of in the disengaged direction and find ways to connect to them that are meaningful. Great, Joe, Madison, anything you wanna to add to that? Well, Janine talked about all these channels. We had the same kind of opportunity and problem. We <laughs> opened up more channels to communicate and at times it's overwhelming um, because some people are using one channel and others are using another and how do you connect those two different conversations together? And there's that little thing that happens. You ever have somebody walk into your room, or your office, whether it's in a, in a private or a work kind of setting, and they say, oh, hey, you know that thing we were talking about a week ago? Do you know what we should do? What do you think we should do with such and such? And so much of that gets lost because when people see people, uh, they engage and that it, it triggers their brain a certain way. They remember things that maybe weren't so important that they put on a task list, but it's an idea or something that's, that's stirring. And it never kind of makes it to their priority list in a given day to pick up the phone and call that person or set a meeting, or maybe it just doesn't even come up in their brain at all. So I think that is the biggest challenge with people working, not even in the COVID sort of times, but just remote workforce. Mm -hmm. And uh, being, this has been a problem that teams have had for a long time, it's just come to, to been pushed on people quickly and trying to have to figure out how to react to that. And so, uh, you know, things that have been effective for me have been to try to set up times that are planned times with those people, um, set up times with groups of people that maybe are associated, but not always directly related, like departments that cross over a little bit and put those people together and force them together in some kind of a way, whether it's a group chat 
on Slack or um, some kind of a room, or it's a meeting. It could be impromptu or it could be um, planned. Those things became even more critical, I think, during this, uh, this time when we were really thrown into it suddenly. Addison, shall I ask another question or do you want to add something to this? Ask another question. Yeah, um, they covered a lot of it there. So, <laughs> so this is, um, so there's a question from a student um, who I take it is working in a company without a specific office that does CSR. And so the question is, how can you get involved in CSR activities when your organization doesn't seem to have an office or a, a way to engage that's readily obvious? Well, I will, I'll just jump in really fast because it speaks to me. So I came to Max that there was no CSR or ESG. Uh, so you actually, it seems like it's a challenge, but it's actually a great opportunity. Um, I don't know if it's public, private, nonprofit, et cetera, but um, you have an opportunity to form and build that. Um, and I also, I mean, I came to Maximus more than seven years ago and started down that path. It doesn't happen overnight, but if you have the passion for it, um, you really can be committed to pursuing that on the side while you're also doing your job because I also did that. Um, but uh, yeah, honestly, I would find that to be the most exciting part, I, to be honest, um, and that students welcome to reach out to me because um, I, I know that path well and it, it can be challenging, but it's really fun. Um, and it's all about framing for your leadership. That's great. So whoever asked that question, reach out to Caleb or Carrie Wilgan to get connected or, or me. You can reach out to me as well and we will find a way to get you connected. I'm uh, also on LinkedIn. So and I do see messages. Perfect. So. <laughs> We're ready to ask another question or Janine or Joe, do you want to comment on that? Just, I would like to just build on that just a bit. I know the question was specifically about ESG, but I would say that if you, if there's something that you have a passion for that isn't in your kind of lane, if you will, I think you can always find that um, to add. It, 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 it does require you to stretch yourself, right? And to do things that are like outside of your quote unquote day job. And my example of that is organization development. So when I came to um, Mason and I was working on my master's, we had a whole set of classes around um, interpersonal and group dynamics. And I was just taken with that, that there was a science around it and, and, and all this research. I, these were some things at that time that for me were kind of intuitive, but I didn't have a framework for thinking about them. And, and I got that. And, and I ended up um, going back to school and getting a postgrad certificate from Georgetown. And um, I really wanted to do OD. Um, but in my current role as a technical program manager, you know, there wasn't a lot of, of that that I could do. So I worked to create um, an OD committee within my company. And I was sort of its first volunteer. And I recruited a few more people. And, you know, that, that organization grew, the opportunity grew, and I ended up working, I was their director of organizational effectiveness, um, my last role there. So um, it's definitely doable for an, in a number of different ways, right? Um, so I just, I just want to endorse that because I think it's such an important thing to keep in mind that you, 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 you have to cover your lane but that doesn't have to be the only thing you do. And, and there are ways to move into these passion, you know, areas that you're passionate about, even if your current job doesn't check those boxes for you or, or, or speak to your heart in that way. Great advice. Okay, so who wants to set, who wants to answer the most impactful CSR related initiative that you've seen? This is a student question, so they're asking you the tough ones. <laughs> well, I'll just I'll just go because this is really, you know, I mean, and Lisa's going to smile because we've we've <laughs> had this discussion multiple times. I'm really involved with the Business for a Better World Center because I don't have this in any other part of my life, right? It is not an area that my current company is. Um, particularly attuned to. And I feel like it's such an important um, um, endeavor that I, I'm, I'm, I'm learning and growing. It, it really, I'm, I'm 
such a neophyte, but I think it's so important for the future. And so um, I will, that's all I'll say is that, you know, this is why I'm involved with Business for a Better World is because I want to, I want to feel more articulate and I want to understand more about how to bring that impact. If I can to my or current organization, if not, maybe to my next one. <laughs> I will say, um, I mentioned it before, this is, this is something our company is, is doing uh, to give back in a way that's relevant um, beyond doing like a check the box activity of donating money. Um, as, a, as a large company in the solar industry, I'm donating equipment and also resources. So later this week, uh, one of the folks from my office here and a bunch of people from our offices over the, around the country, there's 25 of them that are um, heading out to Columbia, and they're going to get to the airport and then drive three hours into the countryside um, to a community that doesn't speak English or Spanish. They speak a local dialect, and they have issues with clean water. And they're going to, um, uh, over a week's time, build a water plant, essentially, that's fully solar powered. So it's pretty cool um, as a construction company, which is really at the heart of what we do, that we're able to be a part of this uh, uh, this organization, and um, our own employees are going um, on this mission, and um, and we're supplying a lot of the the um, materials as well. So, you know, we do our day to day job, just grind it out and get projects and send crews out in the morning, and then we have the ability to be a part of something that's pretty cool um, to help other people that really are just struggling with the basics. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. I'll add in, so uh, something that Joe said resonates a lot is that um, as companies are facing rising public and employee expectations, um, that sort of uh, writing check mentality is no longer mm -hmm. adequate. Um, and so it needs to be increasingly strategic. And so I think the most successful CSR campaigns will be ones that are aligned with the, the true core of a business. Um, so, you know, Lego has their kind of education foundation that they really focus on. Um, uh, at Maximus, we really focus on partnering with nonprofits that are serving the same individuals and families we're serving in communities through workforce opportunities. Um, and, and, you know, deciding as a company where in the um, poverty, poverty cycle is your break point into impacting change. But then you need to establish KPIs to quantify that. We can no longer have qualitative CSR reports. We really need to move to integrated reporting. Salesforce does an amazing job at doing that and quantifying what the impact of your business is, whether it's a CSR kind of community program, whether it's the day-to-day -day of your business, um, you, you've got to quantify. I think that's important that you just said that, given that one of the questions um, that was asked is about the best way to capture the stories of why business for the good of society matters, given that many initiatives don't have measurable outcomes. And I, what I hear you saying, Madison, is you need to find some measurable outcomes. There are measurable outcomes. You may have to think outside the box and, and think of how that is. And it is it is convoluted and, and challenging, but um, there are ways to quantify if you truly evaluate the impact of your program in some way. The qualitative tells a great story and, and is important, but there is always gonna be a quantitative aspect in some way, even if it's a little uh, challenging to find. Could be your goodwill or your brand, you know. So I know we're totally running out of time. So I'm just gonna throw out one last question. I'm gonna give you a choice of which question to answer. Is that okay, um, Caleb and Carrie, who, I think I'm think I'm close to getting over time, but I just can't resist asking this question. Um, what I want to do is um, is to say uh, for the one person who asked um, if there's a particular opportunity or event to find out more information if you're interested in the field of, of in this field in business, 
email me, contact me, I will tell you, but I, I want to alert you to the fact that there is a course, Business 491, Stakeholder Capitalism, being offered by Professor Rashad Hassan in the spring. It's going to be awesome, and it would be a fabulous way um, to get involved um, and, and learn more about this. But I guess the last question that I would ask, um, your choice. One is what piece of advice um, do you wish that you had um, that you want to offer students? Um, so what do you wish that you knew when you were their age that, that you want to impart? The other one would be, um, are there particular internship skills, um, experiences that you think these students can take advantage of to position them as best they can for the workforce? Uh, I can go. Um, so I'll sort of it, answer it conjunctly, I guess, but in conjunction. So um, I I would say that within ESG specifically, if that's your interest area, it is very broad. And I wish I had known that one path isn't, it's not one path, it's a pursue your passion path. Um, and so you can find what factors within ESG you are most interested in and begin to develop that. Um, but it doesn't have to be within ESG. Um, so leadership growth opportunities, project management. Um, I, uh, for new, new graduates, I look for someone who can show their passion through whether it's volunteerism or a project type or something where they're, they're passionate about having an impact. Um, and then, um, I guess in terms of internships, internships and all of that, I didn't do the traditional path with internships because I double majored and transferred. So I had to take class all summer. So while those are helpful and probably make the path easier, um, if your path is different, just know how that plays into your story, um, to be able to pitch that and you will be fine. You just have to frame it the right way. Nice. Joe or Janine? Um, so I would encourage you to, so I, I think the, the thing I would have liked to have known when I was um, younger um, was, to, was to visualize my path as um, more of a spiral than a than something more linear, and I I feel like mm -hmm. I've you know sometimes my roles made sense one thing to the next. Um, a lot of times, just on paper, they didn't necessarily, but I knew exactly what I you know I knew kind of what was happening, um, and I I feel like I learned something in every role that allowed me to move to the next, even though it really if you drew it out on paper you'd be like. I was just wandering all over the place, but it, it had meaning to me. And I wish I'd known that when I was younger, I wouldn't have been quite so stressed um, about like whatever that, you know, getting the next, you know, promotion or the next step level or, or whatever the heck it was, right? Like it was very externally focused. And I think, I think there's a part in your career where those are measurable and those are important, but I would have given myself a little more grace to understand what I was learning along the way and to know that I was gonna use that later and, and it was gonna have huge impact. Fabulous, Joe, final word. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think that um, uh, when I was a younger man, um, things seemed like they were a bigger problem than they were in the short term. Um, and that things that seemed like they were sort of the end of the world, whether it was a relationship, um, uh, that I had to be in a hurry, or if something went wrong, that it was really a major problem. And life has given me perspective. And so I think whether it's personal or professional, is is sort of roll with the punches and know that it's going to be okay. If you take a job and you don't love the job, it's okay. Give it everything you have and find the next thing. Um, give it everything you have until the moment when it's time to make that switch. Um, and if you find a job that they like you, but maybe you're not passionate about it, don't think about that next promotion might be your savior because you have to find what you really care about and what really motivates you and drives you. And it's going to form you as a person, um, those experiences. So, so as Jeannie was mentioning is take them and accept them, 
And I'd also say the biggest thing that I found in my early part of my career was finding mentors um, and people to learn from in the organizations who were willing to share and really genuinely uh, had my best interests in mind. Um, some people, I found something really interesting. I read a study a long time ago that was um, something like 50% of the bosses, um, essentially the bosses think that these people like them and they're friends and the employees actually don't like them. They're just brown noses. <laughs> and then it goes the other way. The employees think the boss likes them or doesn't like them. The boss hates me, but really the boss is afraid of showing favoritism. The boss actually really likes you, but they don't want to show that in the workplace. And so I wouldn't take those things at surface level. Um, and just do a really great job, find people that have big hearts and that care about you and the company and the cause and, and work closely with them and learn what you can because it's gonna benefit you as you grow. Okay, so uh, with that, I want to thank Janine Callahan, Joe Magro and Madison West for taking so much of their time and sharing their expertise um, and being with us today. So on behalf of Career Services, Thank you. Um, this was just an absolute pleasure. Thank you all. For, this was wonderful. This was a wonderful panel. Thank you so much. And students, if you have any questions, please reach out to mycareer at gmu.edu. We're happy to help. Thank yes. you, everybody. Thank you so Bye. much.